Introduction My father was born in Dundee. When he was a young man, his entire family moved to New Zealand, where he met and married my mother. Perhaps because we had so few relatives left in Scotland, I didn't visit that country until I was in my twenties. Even then, I didn't know about the islands of Scotland and their distinctive cultures. That is, until the day when one of my remaining Scottish cousins came out to our house in New Zealand with a beautiful cardigan that he'd bought for me in the Shetlands. I wore the cardigan for many years. Its design wasn't a tartan but something completely different, called Fair Isle after one of the islands in the Shetlands group. It looked like a Maori design to me. Of course, it isn't. But the Fair Isle style of knitting is pretty much the same as styles that are popular in Scandinavia. Thereby hangs a tale, one that I'll soon tell. Eventually, in 2018, I decided to make a proper tour of the islands of Scotland for myself. I wish I'd done so sooner. There was so much to see, from ancient Stone Age cultures to an amazingly strong Norse or Viking influence that I hadn't known anything about either. There are three main groups of islands. The Shetlands, the Orkneys, and the Hebrides, also known as the Western Isles. The Western Isles are further subdivided into the Inner and Outer Hebrides. Although these islands are all pretty far north, they are kept warmer than they would otherwise be by the final currents of the Gulf Stream, which carry enough warmth up from the Caribbean to also ensure that the coast of Norway remains ice-free past the Arctic Circle in winter and to ensure that Iceland remains habitable as well. While they seem remote today, the Scottish Isles, which until 1399 included the Isle of Man, were often at the centre of life in earlier times, when travel by land was difficult and sailing was easy by comparison. For instance, the Celts of Scotland didn't originally speak Gaelic. They spoke Pictish, which was probably a form of Welsh. The quite different Gaelic language originated in Ireland and came to Scotland through the Hebrides and long peninsulas of western Scotland. From the point of view of a seafarer setting out from Northern Ireland, the seas to the northeast appear full of stepping stones that lead to Scotland. If the Inner Hebrides are crossroads between the Scottish and the Irish worlds, the Orkneys and Shetlands are crossroads too, namely, between the Scottish and the Norse worlds. The Shetlands lie halfway between Scotland and Norway and they also lie on a line that stretches from Denmark and Norway to the Faroe Islands, which belong to Denmark, and Iceland. Today, the Shetlands are a stopover on a regular ferry route that runs from Denmark to the Faroes and Iceland. And they were an even more important stopover in Viking times. Gaelic has largely died out on the Scottish mainland, in favour of the English language. But the Gaelic language survives in good shape in the Outer Hebrides, which are about as far away from England as you can get and still be in the British Isles. In much of the Outer Hebrides more than half the population speaks Gaelic, and road signs put Gaelic names first, English second. Because the Shetlands are on an old-time sea road from Norway and Denmark to the Faroes and Iceland. And also about as far from England as you can get in the British Isles. It turns out that Norse influences are very strong there almost as strong on as Gaelic influences are in the Outer Hebrides, in fact. Dialects of Norse known as Norn were spoken on the Orkneys and Shetlands for many centuries before dying out, first on the Orkneys and then on the Shetlands. A map of Scotland and its islands published in 1654 shows the names of many islands in the form of such and such. <coughs> the Danish or Norwegian word for island, spelled O-I with a stroke through the O. Later on, this would be changed to A-Y or E-Y and contracted onto the proper name. Thus, the island shown as Siapinsu in the 1654 map is called Chapinsu now. In fact, there are lots of islands around the British Isles and North Sea whose names end in E-Y or A-Y right down to Alderney, Jersey and Guernsey in the English Channel, as well as islands like Norderney off the coast of Germany. And that gives you some idea of the extent to which the Vikings once commanded the Northern Seas. Not all the islands in the old map have Viking-type names, however, even in the north. The Fair Isle has its present English name, though spelt in an old-fashioned way. Unfortunately, Norn has since died completely out in favour of English even on the Shetlands. So, while Shetland signs also give the Norse name for locations, it comes second there. The names given are Old Norse ones written in the style of spelling used in Iceland and the Faroes, rather than the Norn names for the simple reason that almost no written records of Norn exist. Nearly all Norn speakers were illiterate for the whole of the time that it was spoken. 
Those Orkney and Shetland Islanders who could read and write preferred to record their thoughts in more respectable languages such as English. There's quite a strong Norse influence on the makeup of Scotland as a whole, an influence almost as strong as the far better known Gaelic input. Many Scottish place names, parts of place names, and other Scottish words come from the Norse, even on the mainland. For instance, there are a great many Scottish place names that end in Ness, such as in Venice. Ness comes from the Old Norse word for a headland or the end of a peninsula. The word Firth, as in Firth of Clyde, Firth of Forth, Firth of Tay and so on, comes from an Old Norse pronunciation of fjord, which also survives in Icelandic. Many Scots now identify with Nordic social democratic welfare states in modern political terms, via concepts such as the so-called Ark of Prosperity, Ark of Prosperity .org, which contend that Scotland's true destiny lies in the company of countries like Norway and that it should gain more independence from England accordingly. As such, the formerly almost overlooked Scandinavia nor Norse connection in Scottish history is gaining more prominence, no doubt at the expense of the Gaelic side of things. Still, I was surprised to discover that a lot of the people on the Shetlands didn't consider themselves Scottish, but rather, as Scandinavians who've ended up being colonized by foreigners from Scotland. Part of the reason for the Shetlands' estrangement from Scottishness is that the inhabitants of the Scottish islands have a historical grievance against the lairds, lords, from the mainland who kept the islanders in a state of illiteracy, allowed the Norn language to die out unwritten and also displaced many islanders from their farms in the 19th century in order to run more sheep. The same sorts of clearances went on in the Gaelic-speaking Scottish Highlands. Indeed, to the point that they're usually referred to as the Highland clearances even though they went on in the islands as well. Still, the folk of the Highlands and the Western Isles didn't have any other national identity to fall back on. More Gaelic than Norse in those parts, they were stuck with remaining Scottish. After all, what could be more Scottish than speaking Scots Gaelic and wearing a tartan? But the people on the Orkneys and Shetlands, the Shetlanders in particular, were more Norse than Gaelic and Warfare Isle. I saw a tartan kilted Highland pipe band on the Orkneys which is culturally half and half. But there's hardly any sign of Scottishness of the kilts and bagpipes sought on the Shetlands. Nor do the Shetlanders brew single malt whiskey from local ingredients to sell at a high price, a practice for which the Highlands and Western Isles are famous, and the Orkneys too. The other thing promoting a degree of separatism is that the Shetlands hold the key to much of the North Sea's oil. There's a huge oil processing facility at Salamvo on the Shetland mainland, and the location of the Shetlands helps to enlarge the United Kingdom's, or Scotland's, claim on the oil fields, which would be a lot smaller otherwise. On the other hand, the Western Isles, or Hebrides, don't have much of anything at all apart from wind, scenery, and whiskey distilleries. And so once again there is less fuel for independence in the Western Isles, as we might say. Along with their history of successive waves of Gaelic, Norse and Scottish colonization, the Isles also bear many traces of the Picts and of even older Stone Age and Bronze Age civilizations, with buried villages lately uncovered by erosion at Skara Bray in the Orkneys and Yaltov in the Shetlands, primitive but ingenious circular castles called Brocks, and Stonehenge-like rings of standing stones the nature on Scotland's islands is incredible, too. It hasn't been greatly affected by the human presence and is being restored. Giant white-tailed eagles, relatives of America's bald eagle, are returning to the Orkneys after a century of absence. They have many surprisingly attractive beaches of white and pink sand, including one so vast on the outer Hebrides island of Barra that it serves as an airstrip for scheduled air services, the only one of its kind in the world. It's said of these beaches that they look tropical, but the water isn't. Part of the reason the beaches of the Scottish Isles look tropical is because they often have brilliant white or pastel-colored sand underneath pure, turquoise water. The coasts of the Scottish Isles are mostly rocky, without muddy rivers to pollute the water. And rocky coasts also support the growth of coralline algae, algae that secrete a substance resembling the hard, reef coral of tropical waters onto the rocks beneath the sea. True coral is based on tiny animals rather than algae, plants. It only grows in warm seas, such as the seas that surround tropical islands, the Red Sea, and the waters of Australia's Great Barrier Reef. There, it eventually gets ground up by rocks and waves to produce the brilliant white or pastel-shaded beaches that we associate with such holiday destinations. The hard structures that are produced by coralline algae in colder seas are more modest, 
but produce a similar result once they too have been ground up by the action of the elements. Coral beaches look great, whether they are in Scotland or Samoa. I was in awe of the island life. Enjoy my read. Chapter 1. Travel Tips. In the old days the only way to get to the Scottish Isles was by boat, as in the Sky Boat Song. These days you can fly as well. It's a lot quicker, though also more expensive, and it pays to book well in advance. The main airport on the Shetlands is Sumbra, and the main airport on the Orkneys is Kirkwall. There are many small airports in the Hebrides. TripAdvisor works very well, as does Booking.com and Hostel.com. Accommodation from luxurious to budget can be found on these sites. Major ferry ports for the islands on the Scottish mainland are Oban on the west coast, Scrabster and Gills Bay near the northern tip of the Scottish mainland, and Aberdeen on the east coast. Though these are not the only ones. Ferries also run east-west across the Shetlands from Iceland to Denmark via the Faroes. Flights to the Scottish islands, and within them, are mainly delivered by means of Logan Air. There are also three smaller operators, Air Tosk, which operates flights under a government social contract to some of the remoter islands in the Shetlands group, Hebridean Air Services, which operates a similar service to several of the smaller islands in the Hebrides as part of the Air Tosk group, and Loch Lomond Seaplanes, a flight seeing service. Logan Air code shares with British Airways, so you can book right through to Sumbra on BA. The world's shortest scheduled flight is from Westray to Papa Westray in the Orkneys, taking about a minute over the water between the two islands. And the airport on the Outer Hebrides island of Barra is the only one where scheduled air services take off from a beach, actually a vast expanse of sand that is uncovered at low tide. If you're heading directly for the Shetlands, Aberdeen is the place to leave from as it supports both air services and ferry services. Because the vagaries of local weather, it's good to have a choice of the two modes. One place that isn't shown in the regular ferry map but well worth visiting is the remote island group of St Kilda, the remotest formerly inhabited part of the UK, with the highest sea cliffs in the British Isles. This World Heritage Site is visited by special cruises from the Outer Hebrides. But wait, there's more, a note about the Faroes. The Shetlands are at about 60 degrees north, while the Faroes are at about 62 degrees north. The Faroes are part of Denmark but self-governing. Although now part of a different country, the Faroes share many linguistic, historical and cultural ties with the Shetlands and the Orkneys. The Faroes are intensely scenic with low polar light that makes for great photography and an enlightened Scandinavian social democracy that, as a by-product, makes life easy for the tourist as well, for example, free buses in the capital, Torshavn. Note. In the print and ebook versions of this chapter, I also include a number of websites and other references, which I haven't included in this audiobook. Chapter 2 A Trip to the Orkneys On my father's side, my family comes from Dundee, and from a port district of Edinburgh called Leith. So, I often visit relatives in Scotland. In 2018, after paying my usual call, I decided to do a tour of the Scottish Isles, starting with the Orkneys. Wearing a tartan skirt, I took the ferry from Scrabster, in the far north of the Scottish mainland, to Stromness. Scrabster is a small ferry port, with services to Stromness in the Orkneys. Ferry services also run between the Orkneys and the Shetlands, and between the Orkneys, the Shetlands, and Aberdeen, in addition to local ferries between the various islands of the Orkneys and the Shetlands. I was surprised that so many people catch ferries in these parts and that the ferries go everywhere, you'd think most people would fly these days. It's probably the tourist trade that keeps the ferries going. For the trip was scenic. The ferry sailed slowly past amazing crimson cliffs of a mineral called Old Red Sandstone or ORS, which dates back to the age of fishes and amphibians, well before the dinosaur age. The Orkneys are made up almost entirely of the ORS, which means that they are as ancient as Australia and look pretty much the same wherever the rock is exposed. In the Shetlands, I came across some museum displays which said that, millions of years ago, the core of what is now the Shetland Islands consisted of an isolated mountain range, also known as a monadnock, standing above a plain made of red sandstone, the remains of red desert. So, the resemblance between the ORS and something you'd see in Australia is no coincidence. As a monadnock, the Shetlands probably even looked a bit like Uluru or Ayers Rock, though much larger. 
The former red desert around the Shetlands is now the bed of the northernmost part of the North Sea, save for some above sea level bits that are attached to the old Monadnock. As for the Orkneys, they are also an above sea level bit of the old time desert floor, as is the northernmost tip of the Scottish mainland. The ORS is used for building in the Orkneys, buildings such as St. Magnus Cathedral, erected by former Norwegian rulers in the 1400s, and now quite weathered if you look closely. The ferry sailed past the islands of Hoy and Gramsay, and in addition to the cliffs we saw an amazing rock pillar called the Old Man of Hoy, 137 meters high. If you change that into the old units and say that it is 449 feet high, that sounds even more impressive. The 1654 map makes no reference to the Old Man of Hoy, it seems that it was created by collapsing cliffs after that date. In a similar geological libelink, no doubt, it will topple over and be gone. I arrived at Stromness, on the island called the Mainland, the biggest island in the Orkney group. I caught a taxi, over 30 kilometres, to the Anchorage Hotel in St. Margaret's Hope on the island of South Ronaldsey, accessible by road from the other end of the mainland. The road to South Ronald Sea passes over a couple of little islands called Lamholm and Glimsholm, names that sound like something out of the Lord of the Rings. For, as we've seen, Tolkien borrowed a lot of his ideas from tales told by the Icelanders and the inhabitants of these more remote parts of Britain. The anchorage is in this amazing old stone building with zigzagging crow-stepped gables, which seems to be hundreds of years old. A lovely woman from the hotel named Shona rang me several times to make sure I wasn't getting lost as it was a bit of an epic journey. From St. Margaret's Hope, the next day, I caught a bus to Kirkwall, the capital of the Orkneys and the only town with a five-figure population. I based myself at the Orkadies Hostel. Orkadies is another name for the Orkneys. In Kirkwall I found out that bus services go all over the mainland and South Ronaldsey, and you can get a bus pass to see everything you need to see on those islands for only £20 a week. The skyline of Kirkwall is dominated by St. Magnus Cathedral, named after St. Magnus Erlandsson, a somewhat pacifist Viking who was the Earl of Orkney during his lifetime. Earl Magnus preferred to spend raids praying rather than slaughtering people and was often mocked for it. According to the Orkneyinga saga, which concerns both the Orkneys and the Shetlands, Earl Magnus was eventually done in by a cook named Lifoff who was directed by Magnus's cousin Harkin to kill the Earl with an axe, a meat axe I presume for being such a wuss. Rather conveniently, the earldom of the Orkneys then passed to Harkon. Magnus prayed for the souls of Harkon and life off before expiring, so it is said, and was quite soon declared a saint while Harkon got the earldom, the winner for the time being albeit possibly at the cost of finding the pearly gates padlocked a bit later on. There is also an earl's palace in Kirkwall, now somewhat ruined, though it was built by a much later earl named Patrick who lived around the year 1600 and was a Scotsman. Other impressive buildings include the Town Hall. There's a street called the Watergate, which is amusing for anyone who remembers President Nixon and the scandal that brought him down. From Kirkwall, I set out to explore the sites of the mainland. The first place I set out for was the furthest away, the Neolithic or Late Stone Age village of Scarabray and the aristocratic mansion of Scale House. Late Stone Age or Neolithic cultures were not so different from modern people in many ways. Depending on the conditions in which they lived, inhabitants of the Neolithic or Late Stone Age